You know a dream is like a river, ever changing as it flows. And a dreamer's just a vessel that must follow where it goes. Trying to learn from what's behind and never knowing what's in store makes each day a constant battle or just to stay between the show. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, I am Maxwell Ivy, known around the world as The Blind Blogger. And this is another episode of What's Your Excuse, where I will help you explode those excuses that are holding you back by bringing you interviews with people who have overcome adversity or thrived in spite of difficult life circumstances, people who have struck out on their own and started a unique business, uh, experts who can bring you uh, real world tested advice and suggestions, and people who I just happen to be inspired, motivated, and interested in. So you can find me at theblindblogger.net. That's where you can hire me to get you booked on podcasts and radio shows. It's also where you can hire me as a public speaker. And I do want y'all to visit my sponsors. We have uh, Chip and Pam Edwards at createmyvoice.com, or you can just say, Alexa, play Create My Voice, or Google Talk to Create My Voice, and it'll take you right to their website or their blog. You can reach out to them. Millions, if not billions of people are getting their content through their audio speakers now. If you're not on these devices, you are missing out big time. And they will make the process so very easy and they will not only get you on there, they'll help you create a branding strategy that includes claiming the invocation, the words people will use to find you so that nobody else claims them first. And that's createmyvoice.com. And also the people at, at needoshop.com because without them, uh, my logo and other artwork would not be available on, on shirts and I wouldn't have had them to sell at past events or in future events. Needoshop.com, they make the process very easy. They deliver quality shirts at good prices. And for those of you who want to print your merchandise and possibly make a little money from it, the, the, the split on the royalties is very generous. So check with Alex at Needoshop.com. So today, I have a very uh, special friend and guest with me. Her name is Stephanie McCoy, and I've met her first through Chelsea Nguyen of uh, CN Vision Image Consulting. And uh, we've met in person a few times. And Stephanie McCoy is a the, is the visionary behind BoldBlindBeauty.com. She is a businesswoman, a blogger, a fashion trendsetter, uh, an advocacy for inclusion and empowerment. Uh, she is also someone trying to help dispel the myths and misconceptions about people who are blind and living with vision loss. You can find her at boldblindbeauty.com. You can also check out her magazine. She's a co-editor at the uh, Captivating Magazine and with the intentions of having the first, if not uh, hopefully one of many, totally accessible platforms, both, both for the readers and for contributors. So Stephanie, uh, welcome to What's Your Excuse? How are we doing today? Max, I'm doing well, how are you? I'm doing very good. I'm doing very good. I've, I've done my intro. I cut, checked all my boxes. I didn't stumble or forget nothing. So I'm doing about as good as I get. So, all righty. Um, so to me, and this is just, this is just to me, it looks like Stephanie is a very confident, assured, has her stuff all together kind of a person. So one, would that be right? Two, if it's right now, was it always right? And if it hasn't always been, Stephanie, how did you get from there to here? <laughs> You're so funny, Max. No, that's totally wrong. <laughs> I am not. <laughs> None of those things you described. Um, it's taken me many, many, many years to get to where I'm at today. Um, and I still don't know. A lot of things I don't know. Um, and I think that's the beauty of life is just sort of finding your way. So, yeah, when I was younger, I was uh, very quiet and introverted and afraid of everything. And now that I'm older, I'm still introverted, uh, maybe not as quiet. I'm still afraid of everything, though. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. 
No, I've been lucky enough to see you confront some pretty big fears in your life, especially as they as they re revolve around traveling to strange places by yourself. I've been very impressed with how you've handled that. But why don't you tell people a little bit about your, your childhood and your growing up and your vision loss so we can get an idea of how far Stephanie has come. Sure, I can do that. And, and Max, as per our discussion before this discussion, if I yes. lose track, please rein me back in because I tend to forget midway yeah, through my, I, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, and I'm going to tell you the same thing I told you before. If you're expecting me to rein you in, we is both in trouble <laughs> because, you know, it's the, the rambling tangential conversations that go places we didn't expect but turned out to be better than what I had planned on is pretty much the brand here at What's Your Excuse. So go for it. Cool, cool. Okay, so um, growing up, I felt uncomfortable in my skin. I, I always did. I felt strange and I, I couldn't understand why. I know now today in retrospect i understand why i felt that way but i didn't back then part of it was because of my uh, family background i grew up poor um grew up uh on the system the system uh, air quotes uh, yes and it, it was just really tough for me you know when i looked at some of my peers at school and you know, they would come from uh, two parent households. It seemed like they had had it all together. And it seemed like my background was totally different. You know, I grew up in a single parent household with a mom and my brother. And um, we didn't have a lot, but in retrospect, I think we had everything we needed, um, but I still felt unworthy growing up. Um, and it wasn't until really last year that I found out the real reason why that was. Um, I don't know if you want me to go into that story. Yes, that's like a yeah, sort of please. <laughs> well, it, it sounds to me like, <clears throat> it sounds to me like it probably is part of it, because a lot of times we don't really know how, <clears throat> how much better we have it than others, because we only see what we see. So yeah, I'd like to hear that. Yeah, so um, as I said, we, we grew up with little. We were on the welfare system, single parent household. Um, my grandparents were very, very instrumental in helping both me and my brother as far as anything that we needed, you know, clothing and all that kind of stuff. And, and that's not to say that my mom didn't do the best she could with what she had. I, I believe now that she did. But when I was growing up, I couldn't see that. All I could see is, you know, everything that we didn't have, you know, and I compared myself with, you know, everyone else um, that was around me. But now looking back, I think we, my brother and I had the benefit of, uh, I don't know, just sort of a deeper understanding of what's really more important in life. And I think that's why I felt strange. I felt like a, an outsider, you know, with other people because I've always um, been a thinker. Um, I think very deeply. Um, I've always been um, this sort of kind, compassionate person, but I tried to hide that because I always viewed kindness as sort of a weakness. And I was afraid that if people knew that I was a nice person, they would take advantage of me. So, you know, I, I had a really tough time when I was younger, sort of straddling that fence of being nice, but trying not to let people take advantage of me. But because I was small, I was, I was sort of, um, I guess, different as far as others viewed me. I didn't fit in. Um, I was bullied in school. You know, I, I was thin and, and, you know, sensitive, very sensitive. I would cry at the drop of a, a pen. So, you know, it just, I just felt unworthy as a youngster. Right. And, yeah. And then um, when, have you, have you always, um, been blind or had vision loss or when did that start to happen? 
No, actually, um, that started to happen in 2005. It happened rather suddenly with one eye. Um, although I've never had really good vision, it was just that my vision has always been corrected up until 2005. I had, at, at best, my vision was corrected to 2015. So at one point in my life, I had pilot's vision. It was mm. so uh, great. It was like I could tell somebody, you know, go across the room and hold up a piece of paper and write a word on it. And I bet you I can read it. I mean, that's just how good I felt that my vision was at that time. But when I took out my contact lens back in 2005 and I was looking in the mirror, um, half of my face disappeared. Hmm. I still had the other contact lens in, so that allowed me to see that I couldn't see half of my face. Being that I was extremely nearsighted all of my life, without correction, I couldn't see barely anything. I mean, my vision was always just extremely blurry and, um, you know, it was hard to make out details. So since I still had the, the left contact lens in and I'm looking in the mirror, you know, I'm like, where's, where's my face? And the first thing I thought about, I didn't even think it was my eyes. I thought it was my blood pressure medication. Cause I called my doctor the next day and I'm like, you know, I think this new medication's messing with my vision. They asked me what was wrong. And I told them and they said, no, you need to see an ophthalmologist right away. So I went to the ophthalmologist and he, I'll never forget, he, he pulled his chair up next to mine. I mean, we were so close and I just didn't understand what was happening, but he, he said to me, he said, you know, I'm so sorry, you know, to tell you this, but what you have is a macular hole. Um, and because I didn't know what that was, I'm like, okay, well, you know, what is that? And he explained uh, that my eyes, because I was so nearsighted, my eyes were very, very long and shaped like a football. He said at the back of the eye is the retina. And because my eyes were so long, I'm trying to hold up my hands to describe what I'm talking about, but I can't, I'm not sure where my camera is. <laughs> It's one of those I appreciate it. I'm, I'm sure everybody else knew what you were doing, but I appreciate you explaining it for me. So thank you. <laughs> okay. So imagine a football. Okay. That's yes. the way my eye was shaped at the back okay. of the eye, the retina. Okay. So he yeah. said in my situation with a macular hole, when a vitreous fluid that's inside of the eye pulled away from the back of the eye, it tore a hole in the center. The center is the macula. Right. So he said, um, you know, unfortunately, there's nothing that we can do. He said, however, I can refer you to a retina specialist and we'll see if maybe there's something that they can do. So me being the person I was, I went home, I did a lot of research on the internet and I'm looking this up, macular hole. And with all of my research, now granted, I'm not an eye practitioner. I have no medical background whatsoever. I just love to research. <laughs> so I'm, I'm yeah. looking on the internet to find out what this macular hole business is all about. And everything I found indicated that it only happened in people that were um, considerably older than I was at the time it happened to me. At the time it happened to me, I was in my mid forties. Okay? okay. So uh, I'm looking at this information and they were saying the only way to fix it is to inject a gas bubble into the eye and then you have to keep your head down for a few days to a couple of weeks depending on the situation so i'm okay. looking at this yeah and i'm like a, a needle in the eye gas bubble head down uh-uh nope <laughs> i determined at that point in time that the doctor was wrong my research was, was correct and I did not have a macular hole. I would go to the retina specialist though, you know, just to uh, amuse myself and see what he said. Yeah. So I go to the retina specialist <laughs> a couple of days later and he says to me, uh, Miss McCoy, uh, what you have is a macular hole and <laughs> the way I'm going to repair it is I'm going to uh, inject a gas bubble into your eye. <laughs> You're going to keep your head down for a couple of weeks. 
to allow that bubble to raise to the back of the eye to seal that hole and that's going to fix it. And I'm sitting in a chair and I'm like, okay, <laughs> that's what we're <laughs> going to do. <laughs> oh my gosh. And so you, uh, you had the procedure and, um, and how did that, how did that go? The first procedure uh, didn't go as expected. Once he got in there, he realized that the macular hole was considerably bigger than what he had anticipated. It was a stage four, uh, but he still went in and he proceeded to do what he said he was gonna do. Now, the thing I didn't know that I found out in um, the preoperative stage, right before they took me in for surgery, was that I was gonna be awake for the surgery. Um, they saved that little tidbit. <laughs> they saved that little tidbit for when they're, um, you know, putting in your IVs and everything. And the nurses are like, so Miss McCoy, um, I'm sure, you know, your, your doctor has told you you're going to be awake for this surgery. And I'm like, awake. I said, no, <laughs> nobody told me that. I said, you know, I'm a nervous person. I said, I can't, I can't be awake. I said, you're going to have to keep me asleep. And she said, oh, no, 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 don't worry. She said, we will put you asleep to put in the block so that you feel no pain, but you're going to be awake. They will wake, awaken you. <laughs> and um, sure enough, they did. And what was weird was I could actually see light. I could detect light and I could detect these instruments in my eye and yeah. I could hear the doctor talking I could hear the team talking um and I even I think I remember asking him a question or two during that first surgery um but unfortunately like I said that first surgery didn't work out we didn't find out until about six weeks after the surgery uh because the gas bubble takes some time to dissipate um so he had to go back in a few months later and redo it. That time it did work. I also know during that second surgery, um, I had asked a question or something and all I remember was nothing after that. So it was almost like they knocked me out. So I don't know if I moved yeah. something. Right, so you had two different surgeries to do this gas bubble thing. Um, how, how well did it, did it work as far as correcting your vision and how long did it last? And then what is your vision like today? Uh, the second time he did it, it worked very well. I think we were able to get my vision back to 20, I want to say 2200. It kept improving. So it was like 2400, 2200, 2080, I think was about the best it could get. But remember, back then, it was just the one eye that was affected. So technically, I was still able to drive. I was still able to work. I was still able to do all the things that I ordinarily did because I had one good functioning right. eye. Right. Okay. And so how long did it last before you started, before you started having you know, more issues with the vision? I think... It was about a year or so when I noticed I was having issues with my other eye. And that was one of the things that they told me. Um, I learned a whole lot about retinas. I learned a lot about, you know, vision and how the eye functions through this whole process. One of the things right. that they did for me, because it was the central vision that was impacted, the way they would test that is with a... Um, a device called an Amsler grid. And what an Amsler grid is, is basically just a graph. It's like graph paper. So it's just lines intersecting. And you would have to be able to look at that grid and, and spot the uh, dot that was in the center, in dead center. Well, when your macula is affected, you can't really um, detect that. Not only that, but in my case, the entire grid was all convoluted because the division in that eye in my left eye was the central vision was destroyed so about a year after that i i because i would test my right eye all the time i noticed okay. i was at work 
I was at work and I'm looking at a, um, it was like a pole or something that was next to my desk. And all of a sudden it was like a slight bend in it. And I thought, this is it. This is a problem. And everything I looked at, you know, that day, I noticed it had like a, like a slight bend to it. Um, that was my first indication that there was something wrong in the good eye. Okay. <clears throat> so now you were able to continue working without any special accommodations, but uh, what is the, I mean, f finish the, finish the story as far as the, 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 the way your vision would eventually progress and how it would affect your work in other parts of your life. Okay. Um, once I noticed I was having issues with my good eye, I, I went to an ophthalmologist and she told me that it was a epiretinal membrane. And what that is, is just a, um, like a small pucker. It's called a macular pucker. So it's just a very tiny little deviation in the macula. And I asked her, I said, well, can it turn into a macular hole? And she told me, oh, no, 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 it's just a macular pucker, you know, don't worry about it. But I can tell you, seven days to the day of that appointment, I was in my bedroom looking at my digital clock. I could see the numbers clearly with the one eye and all of a sudden like that, boom, they were gone. All I could wow. detect was red because it was a red light, the, the letter, you know, the numbers. Right. Yeah, the numbers and, on those digital clocks, yeah. Right. The next day I had an emergency appointment with my retina specialist and here it was another macular hole in my good eye. Uh, the interesting thing though with that one was he had read up about um, a procedure, a newer procedure where he could inject the gas bubble into the eye, but I would only have to keep my head down for five days as opposed to several weeks. So um, I said, sure, okay, well, so you're gonna, you know, do this maybe tomorrow or something. He said, no, 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 no. We're going to do it in the office right now today. And I, oh. said, <laughs> I said, so you're going to give me a pill or something to call me, right? Oh, no, 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 no. You're, you're going to be awake. You'll be fine. Trust me. <laughs> My friend who took me to that appointment, she talked me into it. I let her talk me into it. Um, he explained everything that I would experience, but he didn't tell me that I would actually hear the needle sort of going into the eye. <laughs> that was eerie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was very eerie because I'm, I'm sitting there in his chair, in the chair, my, my knuckles are clutching the, my hands are clutching the arms of the chair and I'm not breathing. I, I stopped breathing like while he was trying to inject this needle into my eye. And all of a sudden I heard like a whoosh and he jerked back. Thank God he didn't hurt me at all. But of course that meant he had to go back in again. Right. <laughs> Cause he didn't, yeah. he didn't get the, put the bubble in. So I had to steal myself for him to go in again. And he did. And this time, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm, you know, watching this bubble just form. Uh, well, actually it wasn't one bubble. It was like a bunch of them form in my eye to form one big massive bubble that sort of obstructed my entire uh, line of sight. So, and remember this was the good eye. The bad eye had deteriorated somewhat because I forgot to mention in that eye, I had a torn retina after the second surgery. So um, there were additional issues that that happened that necessitated me going to uh, a lot of different eye doctors, ophthalmologists. I went to Cleveland Clinic. And in the interim, I was able to get some help at work. Okay. Because once the second I was affected, then we're talking, we needed to, you know, help me be able to work with what I had, the vision that I had remaining. So uh, I was told about a software program called Zoom Text that was extremely helpful. Um, it magnified my screen, everything that was on my screen, and it also talked to me. I also had a, uh, a big monitor brought in 
the company I worked for at the time was extremely, extremely um, helpful in getting me anything that I needed to be able to continue to work. So um, it, it worked out really well. It was just adjusting to each stage of my sight loss because it wasn't like something that just happened, boom, and it's done. You know, now I can't see. It was a gradual decline over a period of several years um, and different problems that arose that really weren't related to the original issue. Yeah. So, what is your vision today and what technology are you using today? Today, my vision can no longer be measured by the eye chart. Um, I haven't actually seen the big E in, geez, I guess it's been about 11 years maybe since I've seen the big E. <laughs> I know it's okay. there, I just can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but so the way they measure my eyes is by hand waving, hand waving, or, and I'm waving my hand, Max. Okay. I'm trying to find right. my, <laughs> my camera. <laughs> <laughs> hand waving or finger counting so the um, um you mean that thing that they used to do to me as a kid at school actually has some <laughs> medical value i'm shocked uh, the that? last oh yeah yeah the last time they measured my vision they put my head in a scope and it was like i was looking into the the periscope thingy on a submarine and the machine started making a lot of noise and lights flashed and was through. They said, uh, Mr. Ivy, you have light perception. I said, well, we could have told you that much. Um, but so those are, that's the way they measure your vision. And so at this point you would have, I guess you have what they would call light perception as well. I have light perception. I can still see colors. I can see shapes. Okay. I, can, right. I can detect movement. So that's good. It's just that that's I never good. know what's moving. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this last part is very important. I told you before, a lot of times we end up places I didn't plan on, but better. Um, I think it's important for sighted people and for other blind people to see us talking about our vision loss, our visual acuity, the ways that it's measured as if it doesn't matter to us so that maybe it won't matter and won't be so awkward for people in the future when they meet you or have known you for a little while and they want to ask that question but they're scared. Oh definitely and I, honestly I, I'm glad we're having this conversation because I encourage people to talk about it. I, I want to have that conversation because it's only in talking about it that we can um, begin to understand what blindness really is, right? I used to right. think that yep. blindness was, was seeing versus not seeing. And now I know that it's a very wide spectrum. Yeah, it is. And even among people who have similar vision, um, different people adjust to their vision loss different Differently, and some people better use the technology they they have than other people do. So there's a lot of personal characteristics. As I like to tell people, there is no such thing as a as a blind person or a blind character because we're all very individual. As uh, in in our vision acuity and how we deal with it. Oh, most definitely, and I think you hit on a very important point being individual, you know, it sounds like a broad, a broad thought and it is, but we are. So even as people who are affected with sight loss or have the same eye disease or whatever the case may be, we are individuals. So everybody reacts to it differently. And I try to remind people, not even just with regard to blindness and sight loss, but with other disabilities, or people without disabilities, everybody faces their challenges and their life in their own way. So just because I might go through it a certain way doesn't necessarily mean that somebody else with the exact same condition is going to react to it the same way. Right, so true. And just to remind y'all, I'm talking with uh, Stephanie McCoy, excuse me, Stephanie McCoy, who she has her friends call Steph because we all mess up her first name. Um, 
and she has a nice friendly dog hanging out with us too, which I love because I miss my dog, Penny. Um, but Steph, she is the founder, visionary at boldblindbeauty.com. And she's a businesswoman, a blogger, a fashion trendsetter, and she's really working to encourage empowerment among uh, people with, with blindness and vision loss, as well as helping connect the sighted with the blind. So how did, and that's at uh, boldblindbeauty.com. So where did the fashion stuff come in? And I want to make a comment, something I noticed you said earlier, and I wanted to, I wanted to ask about it. You went to say, I would be scared at the drop of a hat, and you said drop of pin instead. And I was thinking, <laughs> but she likes to wear hats. Why didn't she just say hat? Um, <laughs> So tell me about the style and fashion stuff. <laughs> the style and fashion stuff actually happened. I, 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 first of all, let me apologize for my dog. If she were here, I would call her and I would hold her, but she's in another room. Um, if well, she comes in, I will. Um, the fashion. She's probably just wanting to know where. She's probably just wanting to know when, when, when she'll get her close up. So. <laughs> Probably hey, so. our pets, our pets know whether we tell them or not, you know, she's thinking that that stuff is on TV and she ain't letting me be on TV. So I'm gonna make some noise. Oh, yeah. And she is a little diva. <laughs> but uh, to answer your question, the fashion stuff I thought happened by accident. I as a member of the uh, Pennsylvania Council of the Blind, um, and I, I sat on a couple committees um for the organization i was asked a few years ago to speak to a group of blind women about um fashion and makeup and i said "Ooh, i don't know if i can talk about that because you know i was only recently declared legally blind and i was still sort of uh finding my way through that aspect of my sight loss i'm still learning so i figured who how can i talk to blind women you know about putting right. on makeup <laughs> so uh they wouldn't let me not do it <laughs> 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 i tried i did i tried um, okay i believe so what, you i know you well enough to know that's the truth oh my god i tried yeah i uh, yeah, so what uh, i did I, I i did some research and yeah, i was research again y'all Yep, yep. <laughs> Research on makeup for blind women. And lo and behold, to my surprise, there was very, very little information about it on the internet, except for one site that I did find that was really, really good. And I actually ended up being a peer member or a peer advisor for them. Visionaware.org had a very um, sort of concise step by step uh detailed information on how to apply uh, makeup for blind women so i found that i found a couple other uh smaller things but i really had to make it up <laughs> because there wasn't anything <laughs> out there so i, I well, that actually that actually gives you a certain level of freedom when you know there's no right answer you really can't be wrong can you I thought so, but I still, <laughs> in my mind, I'm thinking there has to be a right and a wrong way. I mean, but what I did, I, I just took, used the knowledge that I had based on my experience from applying makeup, you know, since I was in my early 20s throughout my life and just my own style and everything. And I talked about that and I shared that with with the women. I also shared some techniques that I thought would help make it a little bit easier. Like for example, there's products out there that when you apply them to your skin, they adjust, the color adjusts to your particular skin tone. So I thought, hmm, that's interesting. And that might be something that could be helpful for somebody who can't see very well or even somebody who's blind because you're just going to be using touch basically to make sure that that foundation is um you know smooth into your skin right and the okay, color yeah. you're not going to have to worry about because you will have already asked someone ahead of time hey does this does this look okay on me right right yeah so uh that's that's basically what i did i shared my own experience and you know after having done that research and the talk i thought you know the women had so many questions about fashion and makeup, I thought, I wanna, um, 
I want to help. I want to address this issue. I want to talk about this. And that's when the idea of the blog, Bold Blonde Beauty, came into being. Right. And I think, the, to me, the really important thing about your blog is not the, the actual makeup and style, but it's the attitude you're trying to instill in women who have vision loss. And I think that's really represented in your alter ego, Abby, this character you have created to represent, you know, this, this strong, uh, fashion conscious, trend setting woman who just happens to have a white cane. So where did Abby come from? And am I, am I getting her correctly? You got her. Yeah, you got her exactly correctly. Abby was a, uh, she was in my head. So a few years ago, <laughs> seriously, a few years ago, the only thing I couldn't do was draw her. I have some uh, artistic abilities, but drawing really isn't one of them. So okay. I thought, why not just reach out to the community and ask if there's a designer, an artist who can help me bring her to life. And sure enough, um, young lady in Philadelphia, not too far from where I live, Pittsburgh, she, uh, I reached out to her, Jennifer, Jennifer Burrill, and does I told, she have a, Does she have a website? Because we definitely believe in, in showing gratitude by mentioning those things. So She yeah. definitely does. And if memory serves, it's her name. So it's J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R-B-A-R-I-L-L-E.com. If that's not correct, I will. Oh, well, we'll, we'll find it and get that for people just to make sure. But uh, it's part of our continuing effort at gratitude that we, we definitely believe in, in dropping the names and websites of people who help my guests on their way. So thank you for, for sharing that. So you reached out to her. She's in Philly. You're in Pittsburgh. Yes. And so go from there. We never met in person. We worked virtually. And she drew up several mock-ups for me to choose from. And the final product that we have today was what she uh, drew for me. Now I did have another graphic artist um, sort of sharpen the image up somewhat and she added a couple little tiny touches that unless you really looked at it very closely, you probably wouldn't notice, but um, she's just fabulous. I, I love I just love the way she looks. I love the way she's sort of like, you know, on the move and just her whole. She pretty much, she just, she pretty much owns the world, doesn't she? she I mean, she does. <laughs> she does. And she's, she's so how real. Did she get in your, so how did she get in your head if you see yourself as this shy, scared person in real life? Because in my head, <laughs> in my head, <laughs> in my head resides this other person, this alter ego someone who is strong, someone who is confident, someone who's all the things that I wanted to be and I thought I wasn't um, until last year. That's another story. But when I finally found out that kindness, compassion, and empathy and those types of things weren't weaknesses, they were actually my strengths. And I was able to embrace that. That's what got me to where I'm at today because for all of my life I have thought that I was just like this like you know fledgling like weakling like type person who was faking you know uh sort of walking the talk but not really feeling it deep inside of me well we're glad that uh, more and more of that is coming out and it's amazing how much progress you've made in the last year now you also have a book, and, and your book is uh, in Braille as well, and I think it even has, um, like, uh, like, Braille artwork in the book. Am I remembering that correctly? Yes, you are. You are. Well, every once in a while it works. So, so tell people about your book. What's it about? And, and uh, mention about about how this project got done, because I think there's a real what's your excuse lesson in the, in the book and the way you got this done. <laughs> okay. Um, 
the amazing journey of bold blind beauty to me has been nothing short of miraculous in a way and the people that i have met that cross paths with the gentleman who created my book and it's basically an about bold blind beauty okay so it just tells the story of bold blind beauty it talks a little bit about me it talks a lot about abby and who she is her story and at the very back of the book is a braille image of Abby. So for uh, my totally blind friends and even people who can see, they could see the uh, braille image of her. But for my totally blind friends, what's cool is that they can actually feel what the image looks like. And that's very exciting. But the gentleman who created it uh, connected with me on LinkedIn and he, he just reached out one day and I can't remember what he said, but I responded back to him because I respond to everybody who leaves me, um, you know, real comments. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, everybody, everybody that doesn't start off with, I want you to hire me, you respond to them. I got you. Right, right. Or, you know, can we date or whatever? And yeah. those I don't answer. <laughs> but yeah. this guy, this guy was legitimate. And I responded back to him and he said, you know, I've been following you for some time and I'm such a fan. He said, I'm your number one fan and I want to do anything I can to help you out. Now, keep in mind, we have never met in person, but right. he has um, created these books for me for different conferences, meetings, any kind of events that I go to that when I need these materials, he creates them for me. And the, the message you're talking about is one I shared at two conferences last year where I had uh, thought to myself, again, it's me in my head, not a good place to be sometimes, but I thought I cannot ask him to do this for me for free because I value him. I value his services. I value people. And I wanted him to know how much I value that. So what I did I said, you know, look, I need X amount of, of books created for this event. And I said, can you just let me know how much you'll, you'll charge me for them? And he said, sure. And he, he, he replied back with a price. And um, after I picked myself up off the floor, because <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God, this is so much money. <laughs> Yes. I, I, I responded immediately. Uh, did I respond to the email? No, I called him. I called him and I said, uh, you know, can we, can we lessen the amount of the books or something? Cause I wanted to figure out a way that I'd be able to afford to pay him. And that's when he right. said to me, he said, Steph, he said, uh, Oh God, I can't even remember exactly what he said. Well, it doesn't have to be exactly what was, what was the point? It was something like, you know, don't, don't deny me, you know, my opportunity to bless someone else, to bless you. And <laughs> as he was talking on the phone, seriously, we were on the phone. I start crying. I start crying like a maniac. I mean, like a blubbering idiot. And he's like, are you crying? I'm like, yeah, I'm crying. I'm like, oh my God. I said, you don't know how much this means to me. <laughs> what, what the lesson taught me was, you know, there are people out here in the world. Number one, I believe the majority of the world are good people. I believe that with my heart and soul. I'm right there with you. Yeah. Uh, number two, of those very good people, a lot of them want to do good and they want to help out and they don't want anything in return. And this gentleman, Robert Oots is his name from Miami Accessible Media Project. Yes, Robert, I'm talking to you. <laughs> he, <laughs> and we will, we will find him so that we give him his proper credit. Don't worry about it. Yes, we will. He has been amazing amazing but it's not just robert carla my friend uh carla ernst she passed away last year carla reached out to me on the blog and wanted to help and next thing i know we're talking the first conversation we were on the phone for like three or four hours i never yeah. i never met this woman i never met her in person <laughs> she was in milwaukee i'm in pittsburgh we're talking 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 she was a communications professional. And she's like, I want to help you. I want to help you with bold blind beauty. 
And I said, but I can't pay you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> like, I'm not asking yeah. you to pay me. And, yeah. Um, yeah. And the oh. funny thing about the, and the really crazy thing about this is me and her, me and Stephanie, we're both speaking at an event last year in Erie, Pennsylvania, put on by our good friend, Amy Bonverd at amybonverd.com. And um, I get up there and, and at part of my talk, I'm talking about how we, we, uh, we can't let people, we, we can't rob people of their joy of helping us. And I sit down and then Je Stephanie stands up and she's like, we can't rob people of their blessings. And I'm like, we just gave the same talk, you know, uh, from two different people from two different states halfway across the country. But it is so true. If we will let people help, if we will stop saying we can't afford it, so we won't ask them. And we stop keeping people from from serving us and serving the rest of the world. Great stuff like this can happen. So I'm really glad that you were uh, able to share those stories. And I love your dog. By the way, what's the dog's name? Since it's obviously going to have to get screen credit. <laughs> Molly. Molly is her name. Molly Millicent McCoy. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's definitely a diva's name. Um. Yeah, but see, now I can blame the dog for being confused instead of people wondering if I'm that way in person. So, but yeah, these are great examples of what I tell people all the time, that most of the blogosphere, the podcasting world, the online world in general, there are so many more good people out there than bad, but a lot of times we do get in our own way. We do expect, uh, we do say no when, if we would just have the conversation, there might be a way to get the yes. And so I really appreciate you sharing that. In other words, um just one other thing i just wanted to add. oh yeah um now you uh when i saw you you had uh you had mugs with uh with braille printing on them you had your books um how are you how are you dealing with the whole idea of being an icon a trendsetter or even maybe an influencer is that something that the the shy stephanie still 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 struggles with maybe Yes, the shy Stephanie does struggle with that. <laughs> Evidence is this particular podcast right now. I get so nervous and, and, and sort of worked up when I'm about to speak to people or if it's in a public forum or whatever, but it seems like once I get on track, then I'm sort of okay. But I'm yeah. so much better behind the scenes. Honest to God, I'm just like, let me just be behind the computer, you know? Yeah, yeah. Now, let me let me tell a little on this on this woman because I doubt she would tell this if she, if it, because it it basically just blows up this whole myth of hers. Um, I gave a talk last year in Orlando where they basically gave me a pass on using slides because they said, well, there's no way that can work. And I said, okay. I, um, I go and I watch Stephanie and this woman, she just had total command of that clicker. She had uh, slide images and audio files. And I was just so blown away by your talk. I was sitting back there and I'm going, man, I'm glad I came on before her. Cause if I went on after her, people would be going, Max, <laughs> when does the show start? You know what I mean? I really honestly was impressed by you. And, I, and I'm glad that I made, made sure to tell you that that day because it's another one of those cases where people assume that we are either capable or incapable of doing something. And you basically went up there and just totally blew that excuse all the way up for me. Yeah. And that was a lot of fun, Max. Actually, it's funny because now we've been together, what, three times? Kansas uh, City. Let's see. We went to Can Wichita, Kansas, Erie, Pennsylvania, Erie? and New Jersey. And we met, we met in New Jersey, but you know, that was such a short meeting because that event was it just was. so crazy. So, but yeah, and, and it's, it has been really cool to see the difference between Stephanie when you were making that first trip to Kansas by yourself versus uh, seeing you in Erie. And then even just a few months later, I mean, Erie was in October and here it is January. And it was like, you had, it was like you were two different people between between the, the second time I saw you and when I saw you up there in, in uh, New Jersey. And it's, uh, but it's, I guess it's one of those things. Once you start, you know, once you break that eggshell, there's really no going back, is there? No, definitely not.
Okay. Well, what are a couple of things you could share with my audience as far as how you managed to start making progress to become the confident person that, that, is, that is represented represented by your alter ego, Abby? Well, uh, like I said, a lot of it happened last year at a women's retreat for blind and visually impaired women. Um, but I, I think if I had one piece of advice for people on how to become confident, it would be to be yourself, to just be yourself, be authentic and, and don't fight it. Because for so long, I tried to hide behind someone that I thought that I should be, you know, because of what public, the public might have perceived of me as opposed to just being me. And now that, you know, I'm being real and I'm being myself, it's just, it's liberating. Um, it's scary, but, you know, at, at the same time, there's really no thinking to it because you know who you are, you know, and you can be comfortable in that. So I feel good knowing that I am who I say I am and who I say I am is not necessarily the work I do because I used to believe that my work was my work. And today I no longer subscribe to that. My work is who I am and who I am is a kind, compassionate person who cares about other people. And I call myself an abilities crusader. I fight for abilities. It's about what we can do, not about what we can't do. Well, I think it proves that one of the things we really have to do is to take the time to find out who it is we are and, and instead of who it is we think we should be or who that person is that everybody else has seen for so long if we're going to make any real progress. I know me personally, when, uh, when I think about my, about my uh, I guess you'd say my alter ego online, I have days now where I still don't think, uh, excuse me, is that the guy they see? Because I have days where I'm not that guy. So, <laughs> so well, Matt, I, I, yes. I just wanted to say I am so honored, thrilled to have you be in my circle of friends because you're one of those people. And we met before Chelsea. Yeah, we, we met through the other. Vision Aware Peers group and we had right. we had been on group calls and we had exchanged emails and I think we even worked on a blog post together once. I think we did. I think we did. But you, you know, meeting you in person and being able to talk with you and listen to your stories. You're such a great storyteller. <laughs> I love listening to your stories. <laughs> and we just had yeah. so much fun. You know, yes. I'm just so yeah. I, I felt really bad for Chelsea because it was like me and you were at a party and she was at a dental exam. <laughs> that was, that's just how I felt. I mean, I understand it was a very important, critical thing for her future business success, but we were there and we enjoyed it. And I felt like the whole week she was having a dental exam or something even worse, whatever that next procedure might be. You know, maybe, right. maybe she was having a colonoscopy, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, I think maybe the last day her and Jeremy did have some fun, but most of that week. And so, but I do appreciate it. I'm very happy and proud to have you in my, in my, in my circle as part of my online family as well. Um, but I would like to mention that retreat you went to because you went to it, Amy went to it, and she credits it a lot um, it for a lot of her progress is putting in putting herself out there in the world over the last year. So who's who's so just so I don't forget um, to re reference that whose uh, retreat was it and and where was it <clears throat> and are there maybe some other you know really awesome people who were there who whose lives were changed by being part of it. There were a lot of people that were there, I, I believe, whose lives were changed. The small group of women that I was with, there was 12 of us all together. Um, yeah. We call ourselves the Giggle Girls because we giggled the whole time, it seems. <laughs> but we had, we had such a great time. But Becky Andrews, Becky Peterson Andrews is the genius behind the Daring to Own Your Story Women's Retreat. It was held in Park City, Utah, 
uh, for four days, I believe. It was a Thursday yeah. through Sunday. Um, yeah. We did a challenge. I mean, we did so many things that honestly I would never have done because I remember how I told you at the beginning, I'm afraid of everything. <laughs> I seriously mean that. I am afraid I'm, of everything. Yeah, I'm still trying to figure out how you managed to make it through the Dallas airport that day. I'm still trying to figure that one out. But I, but you got there, so. I did. But yes. I did, but yes. yeah, Becky, um, oh God, I love her. She, she's another one of those amazing people. I featured her on Bold Blind Beauty. And actually she reached out to me not too long ago asking if she can help as well. As a matter of fact, recently I've had several people, men and women, ask if they could help in some capacity. So it's really something, it, it, and it doesn't feel like it belongs to me and I don't think it should. I think it sh it's bigger than me, which is <laughs> great. So I'm really excited about yeah. that. And like you said, the most important part behind it, it's not so much the beauty, the fashion and all that stuff. That's fun. But the beautiful part about it, in my opinion, is the empowerment and the, the deeper messages behind some of the, the posts that we publish. All right. Well, Stephanie, I've had a lot of fun during, the, uh, during our time together. I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down with me. And also, I do sincerely know how difficult it is for you um, to, to do something like giving a talk or, or, or doing a podcast interview. So I appreciate you trusting me enough to sit down and do this with me. Thank you, Max. It's a joy. You're a joy. <laughs> Oh, thank you. <laughs> All righty. Resume the Okay, well, we had another great conversation with my friend Steph from boldblindbeauty.com. Bold She's also the, the co-producer, editor of uh, Captivating Magazine, which we didn't get around to talking about, so maybe that'll be an excuse to have her back on or maybe have her and her co-producer, Chelsea, on at some point in the future. Uh, but I have really had a good time. I learned a lot of things about Stephanie. Hopefully there wasn't too much information for you guys about the, um, the vision loss and the medical procedures. And hopefully we didn't make anybody sick or make you cringe or make you go, yeah, because I know I did it myself a couple of times. So, but I do think it's important. We talk about it. We help people understand that they don't have to be so awkward when they ask that question, you know, because so many people that when they go to ask me about it, they're like, I don't want to offend you. Is there a, a, a correct or polite way to ask this question? Do you mind talking about it? And even when I'm interviewed on podcasts, many of the hosts will approach it as, as if it's an awkward, difficult question that they're afraid to ask me. So I think we did a good job of dispelling that myth this morning and letting people know both sight and blind that it's okay to ask. It's important to talk about your, your vision loss, but do it in a positive way and talk about, you know, how, how your life is, uh, is maybe different and maybe even how it's better as a result of the changes in your personality. So we just have to see, and remember, we're all individuals, sighted, blind, people with disabilities, healthy people, old, young, we're all individuals. There is no one quote, unquote person from any from any group that you can think of and that's a good thing to remember i think one of the most important lessons we learned from stephanie stephanie is that um once you start facing the fears facing the person that you thought you were and start becoming that new person that once you start that once you take that first little step that there's really no way to go back that you're going to continue um finding out bigger and bigger things about who you are and what you're capable of. And just like I sing the river because I didn't start out being the person I am now. It started with my family losing the carnival business and me needing to start a website. And it started with me filing for a domain name without knowing how I was going to build the website. So over the, over the years, I've gone from that person to where I'm at now. And that took that first step. So maybe there's one, one little thing you've been thinking about, maybe one thing you can admit about yourself today that's positive or different, maybe something that's even scary, because if you think about it and accept it, it's going to make you think about other things. That's something I learned from Steph. Another thing I learned from her is that we are not our disabilities and we're also not our jobs or professions. 
Um, and I think that we, we learned that Stephanie has gotten to that point where she will face her fears and do things that scare her, which including speaking in public and coming on my podcast. And while we joked about it, uh, she is legitimately nervous about things like what we did this morning. I appreciate the fact that she trusted me enough to come on my podcast and have a conversation to, uh, to share some, some experiences, some information, and to laugh about some of this stuff. And I'm really honored to have been there to see her transformation over the last year or so, to see a lot of these changes. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing where this continues to take her. For example, we spoke at the same event. Um, I had my books and my shirts. She had her books and her mugs and stuff. But she had these gorgeous three-foot-tall uh, display banners for her area. That's something I need to do. And she has actually sat down and thought about not only who Steph is, but who Abby is. And just to remind y'all, Abby is the character that represents her brand as Bold Blind Beauty. And so she's thought about who Abby is, what she thinks about, how she lives, what her attitudes about things are, including fashion and style, but also about how Abby would live life. And I think we all need to do that. Whether we have a character or an icon or an avatar that represents us or not, we need to think about, okay, who are we? What makes us special? What makes us get up in the morning? And then go from there to, to, to find ways that we can enhance what we already have. All right, I appreciate y'all. Uh, watching and listening and supporting the people on my shows as well as the people in their lives. I really do appreciate that. And we will include links so y'all can check out some of the people that Steph mentioned. <clears throat> now, you can also hire the blind blogger. You can book me to speak at your event for your organization, for your company. And I will share my hilarious stories, teach life lessons, sing a little bit, and I will um, cover my three main messages, which are you have to decide to find solutions instead of making excuses. Uh, you have to ask for help and accept help when offered. And you have to be determined to find the positive in every aspect of your life. You can find me at theblindblogger.net. You can also find this podcast, The What's Your Excuse Show, on any of your podcast players or on YouTube. And I do hope you will visit my sponsors, createmyvoice.com talk to create my voice on Alexa or uh, excuse me, play, play, create my voice on Alexa and talk to create my voice on Google. Uh, you can also do the same with my blog. You can say uh, Google talk to the blind blogger or Alexa play the blind blogger, or you can even say Alexa play the blind play the what's your excuse show on TuneIn. So those are some ways you can get your content where it's more convenient and accessible to you. And I look forward to hearing from you. I'd love to hear something that, uh, that Steph shared that made you think or made you take some action. I'd love to hear anything that I have inspired you to do over the years from watching and listening and reading my posts. Uh, like I say, that's theblindblogger.net. And if you have any questions, anything you need to need help with or looking to, to uh, maybe take some steps in your own life, just reach out to me. There's a contact form on there, theblindblogger.net. So until next time, thank you and take care out there. Too many times we stand aside and let the water slip away to what we put off to tomorrow has finally come today. So don't stand upon the shoreline and say you're satisfied choose to chance the rapids and dare to dance the tide do you want to stop yes